There is no formal process to determine who is a scientist and who is not a scientist. So at what point does a software engineer become a computer scientist? An analyst become a data scientist? A trader become an economist? A rock collector a geologist? A gardener an agriculturist? An athlete a physicist? turns out that the criteria to become a scientist is not only quite simple, but perhaps you've been a scientist or in part one for a long time without knowing. Someone who conducts scientific research to advance knowledge in an area of interest is a scientist. Scientific research is the interconnected process of taking observations about the world, making predictions that identify some pattern about those observations, testing those predictions against observations, adjusting your predictions and retesting, and publishing your findings. So if you do these things, you are a scientist. It is important that you decide what stage of the process you're in. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we comp... No, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature or we say compared to experiment or experience, compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. Perhaps you've already published your findings and you've realized some mistake, so you need to go back to the adjusting prediction stage to reevaluate your publication. Or perhaps you've spent the last decade reviewing others' work to identify some pattern, and now it's time to make those observations yourself to confirm the pattern. Or maybe you just jump right into guessing a prediction. Each of these stages are important to the scientific process, but it is the observation stage that makes science so rigorous. Observations are at the center of all science, and who better than Dr. Sabine Hassenfelder to tell us that? And I welcome you to Science Without the Gobbledygook. I think the task of science is to explain observations. So if you want to know whether something is science, you need A, observations, and B, you need to know what it means to explain something in scientific terms. What scientists mean by explanation is that they have a model which is a simplified description of the real world, and this model allows them to make statements about observations that agree with measurements. And here's the important bit, the model is simpler than just a collection of all available data. Usually that is because the model captures certain patterns in the data, and any kind of pattern is a simplification. Visually speaking, a scientific model gives you a curve that connects data points. This is arguably oversimplified, but it is an instructive visualization, because it tells you when a model stops being scientific. This happens if the model has so much freedom that it can fit any data, because then the model does not explain anything. As a scientist, this may place you in a dilemma. On one hand, it feels that you should be the only one taking observations about the world, because your understanding is the only understanding you can always attempt to confirm. Did I really see that? And on the other hand, there are simply too many experiments to be taking these observations alone. So you have a decision to make. Do you consider yourself the only person capable of making valid observations? Or do you consider others capable of making valid observations? Almost all modern scientists work together and share ideas, so they and I are in the latter group. But for those in the former group, what I find so crucial to understanding the scientific process lies in the observation. A scientist who learns of an experiment from another observer is non-locally correlated with the data of the original experiment, but they will never be able to directly hold the information that represents the experiment. No matter how rigorous your experimental setup, your personal observation is limited by the fact that information and data describes a system, but does not physically exist despite having a physical representation in all cases. But the computer's not doing any binary numbers. It's just switches. Switches that are open, switches that are closed. The binary numbers are in my head and in your head because we agreed open switch will represent that with a zero. Closed switch will represent that with a one. And we invent the binary number system to help us do that. Thus, there is no transfer of information across observers. This is a really, really big deal, and it can be easily glossed over and even vehemently denied by others and even yourself if you're not careful. This reveals the beauty of object-oriented programming, but it also instills a false sense of reality. And if you recall, I believe particles are observers, despite the fact that they do not hold an internal state by definition. After I came to this conclusion, I began to attempt to put to words what I was describing. To do this, I turned to quantum mechanics. 
Looking at the single slit diffraction pattern, which is quite easy to do at home with a laser pointer and some flat edges, you can see that the intensity or brightness of light at this point and at this point are exactly the same. Thus, they are correlated. But not just any correlation, the origin of these correlated intensities is the laser pointer. Thus, they are causally correlated, where the laser is the cause. Additionally, the data can be referred to as non-locally correlated because it was spatially co-located during photon release, but not at photon detection. Perfect observations are impossible because the sensor is always causally correlated with the thing being observed. However, that does not mean that you can't treat two particles or systems of particles at random as very probably independent of each other, effectively uncorrelated and unentangled. See, if I rip a photo into two and ship one half to New York, then the two parts of the photo are now non-locally correlated. They share information. But that correlation was created locally, so nothing weird about that. Entanglement is also locally created. Suppose I have a particle with a conserved quantity that has value zero. It decays into two particles. Now, all I know is that the shares of the conserved quantity for both particles have to add to zero. So if I call one of the shares x, then the other one has to be minus x, but I don't know what x is. This means these particles are now entangled. They are non-locally correlated, but the correlation was locally created. Once I felt I was properly semantically describing these events, I ran a search for this description, which led me to this video, where Dr. Ricardo Manzati perfectly describes the phenomenon. Whenever something happens in the bank, I want to be informed, send someone with a message, for example, a piece of paper. There is something that it is physically flowing or moving from the bank to my, my house. But this is very expensive to send someone every time they want to inform me about what has happened. It might make sense to build a chain of domino tiles. And whenever something happens, the director of the bank will just make the domino tiles topple against each other, like that. You may say that there has been a flow of information. But as you can see, nothing has flowed. This tile is still here. There was no exchange of matter or energy. Then what do we describe what has happened in terms of a flow of information? Mostly because we were very fond of the metaphor of the messenger who is carrying a message. So, what has happened? Simply that this physical system has been built in such a way that whatever happens to one of its end has a high probability to happen also at the other end. I'm not going to play his entire video for you, but I highly recommend you watch it as many times as it takes to understand it. The key takeaway is that all physical phenomena, everything that can be observed, is just a collection of physical events. There's nothing else. The important thing for those in the former group to understand is that you, all your molecules and all subsequent structures built upon them are subject to this law. If you're skeptical that your choices can be represented by a collection of physical events, let's see what the scientific method tells us. All laws of nature, which we currently know, work with those differential equations. These laws have the common property that if you have an initial condition at one moment in time, for example, the exact details of the particles in your brain and all your brain's inputs, then you can calculate what happens at any other moment in time from those initial conditions. This means in a nutshell that the whole story of the universe and every single detail was determined already at the Big Bang. We're just watching it play out. A lot of people seem to think this is a philosophical position. They call it materialism or reductionism and think that giving it a name that ends on ism is an excuse to not believe it. Well, of course you can insist to just not believe reductionism is correct, but this is denying scientific evidence. We do not guess we know that brains are made of particles, and we do not guess we know that we can derive from the laws for the constituents what the whole object does. Those physical events can have varying levels of abstraction, but the most successful abstraction to date that dictates the movement of particles is the standard model. 
What are the fundamental building blocks of the universe from which you, me, the stars and everything else is constructed? In the centuries since Galileo, thousands of theories and experiments have peered into smaller and smaller distances, converging on a single picture of the structure of matter. This somewhat daunting looking formula is where we end up. It gives the correct answer to hundreds of thousands of experiments, in some cases with an accuracy that is unprecedented in science. It is, by any measure, the most successful scientific theory of all time. And we call it the Standard Model. Now, if we expand this equation, it gets a bit messier. Instead of using this equation directly, I typically think of the Standard Model as the equation that dictates these movements. In theory, all things can be broken down into an element of this equation and the future of those things would be known. Thus, if you try to consider some hypothetical state of all particles, all matter is causally correlated with all other matter in an infinite balanced and rhythmic cosmos. So what does this mean for free will? Well, despite Dr. Hassenfelder's strong stance that there is none, it is important to point out that you do not keep a local copy of the state of everything. So you do not have access to all that is knowable. From your perspective, your response to your implications of your actions is not dictated by the cosmos, but instead by your limited understanding of your surroundings built up through experience and millions of years of sensory actions. Personally, I feel this is effectively free will, as to you, your perspective is what defines your decisions, not the cosmos. Until we can somehow personally know with certainty each and every movement made, it will continue to be free from our perspective. However, if you're capable of looking at the entire picture, it isn't free. Hypothetically, if you did keep a local copy of the state of everything, you would also know your own reactions to this knowledge, and thus you would be imprisoned by your own thoughts. Everything, including your own actions, would be determined and known. And now that you know what it is like to know, you know that not knowing is freedom. Maybe this explanation isn't enough for you, so let's say hypothetically you could know everything. What steps would you need to take to do that? As a human, you are fundamentally limited by the speed at which you're able to consume information and internalize it in terms of other information. For example, this is the Azure documentation loaded up into an Obsidian Vault, the same software I use for my notes. It would take a lifetime to get through this documentation, and by the end of it, Microsoft will have surely released entirely new documentation. Many companies that distribute industry-leading software can also have this much complexity in their products. There's over two in that it is a large amount of code. Furthermore, about 30,000 academic journals are published in English. A wildcard search on Google Scholar between 2021 and 2022 results 2.6 million results. And the average number of readers per article is often less than 10. So those in academia are pressured to keep publishing, which results in many people releasing what can be known as write-only articles. So you can plainly see that there's just too much information to count for everything. And few people are consuming this information. As a result of this, the information presented in these articles is growing increasingly inscrutable. Thus, I tend to treat published information not as a primary source on an observation, but as my observation of an observation. You should do this because you won't be able to fully understand the experimental setup without being within the mental framework of the experimenter, which could lead to reproducibility issues. Words cannot always capture the thoughts of the experimenter, and English words can often be interpreted in many ways. The sensors you use and how they respond to the environment are also a kind of observation. You observe how the sensor responds. So not only should you treat published information and sensor responses as an observation of an observation, but you should treat your own thoughts as such. This is a kind of meta-analysis, thinking about thinking. When you introspect, you have to treat your own introspections with the same circumspection, the same caution that you treat everybody else's. So what you're saying is that unless you can take that first person experience and subject it to the third person neutrality, That's it. it's not science. That's right. If you've spent any amount of time around various scientific equipment, you might notice quite large discrepancies between measurements made by different sensors which claim to use the same units. This is why NIST has implemented a traceable calibration which certifies the sensor's NIST maintained measurement standards. In my opinion, this leaves me with the strictest interpretation of a scientist. They flag all conclusions to be independently verified by observation if needed, and they are willing to abandon any truth at any time as a result of any previously incorrect understanding or assumptions, which can be hard at times, especially because your work is so valuable to you that it can often feel like you need to protect it. So it turns out that if your goal is to advance knowledge, then the only thing that needs protecting is the scientific process. So take a look at yourself. Is what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis science?